Hi everyone, welcome to the VR for First Timers Workshop presented by the Media Creation Lab team. My name is Tim and I'll be your host today. So here's an overview of the workshop. It has two parts. The first part is an introduction to VR, looking at definitions and the history of VR as well as different types of experiences and present day applications and future considerations. Second part is an introduction to the Oculus Quest product line, specifically the Quest and Quest 2. Um, I'll outline some strategies to mitigate and avoid motion sickness, which is a common outcome. Then I will show you how to put on the headset and use the controllers. And I'll describe the guardian feature. And then from there, I will guide you through a non-interactive activity that we've chosen and then a interactive an interactive activity that we've chosen and you can experience those vicariously if you don't have a headset and then I'll just pose a few questions to consider at the end so introduction to VR What is virtual reality? So here is a precise definition, courtesy of Merriam-Webster. It's an artificial environment that is experienced through sensory stimuli, such as sights and sounds, provided by a computer, and in which one's actions partially determine what happens in the environment. So I like this definition, it's very apt, but for the purpose of this workshop, I'd like to broaden the definition based on this more precise one. So this broader definition is an artificial and usually ad hoc environment that is experienced through sensory stimuli such as sights and sounds and which facilitates an intended experience. So you might have noticed that this broader definition excludes the computer aspect. And that's deliberate because um, if you think about it, VR technology is a fairly new way of something doing something very old. And that something is storytelling, or in a larger sense, displaced communication. And storytelling is a fundamental and unique activity to humans. It's something that only we can do. And regardless of whether it's presented through VR or some other medium, storytelling and displaced communication is intended to put the listener or the viewer or the reader or the player in a different place with respect to time and space. So in other words, VR and its technology is contemporary, but its underlying intent is ancient. So with this broader view of VR technology, you can appreciate and recognize that it's the culmination of hundreds of years of related innovations and advancements. So most people would probably place the origin of VR in the mid to late 80s. That's when the term virtual reality is coined, 1987, by Jaron Lanier, the co-founder of the company that makes this VPL data glove. He and his company partnered with NASA and they in turn developed the first complete VR system that resembles the one that people imagine when they think of VR. So head mounted display with handheld motion controls. Some people might place the origin of VR earlier to the 60s in which there's a handful of pioneers who recognize the potential for computing technology and they not only articulate those visions, but they also develop it. So things like human-computer interaction and the possibility of realistic computer-generated visuals, they emerge in the form of the first head-mounted display and 3D models that are used, for example, in the Apollo space program. Even though these developments are very primitive by today's standards, they kind of um, set the groundwork for VR. But of course, these advancements don't happen in a vacuum. They owe their development to prior developments in the 
Second World War and early Cold War. So flight simulators that combine physical mock-ups and pre-computing technologies, as well as um, very basic light board displays to track aircraft. And these advancements in turn owe their development to pre-computing innovations like panorama paintings in the late 1700s. Um, those are a genre of painting that uh, present canvases on curved and wide surfaces that, and they're painted in such a way as to resemble the real view of a landscape. And then half a century after that, there's a stereoscope that's invented. And a stereoscope is a device that presents slightly different image, slightly, slightly different images to each eye. And that's noteworthy because every VR headset, past and present, is essentially a stereoscope, including the one that I'm wearing right now. So what you're seeing right now is the imagery from one of the lenses because this headset doesn't have the processing power to show and combine the imagery from both lenses. And then also a century after that, there's Vitorama, aka Cinerama, and that's used in flight sims, early flight sims. It's basically a system of presenting multiple um, projections from different projectors that show slightly different images on a curved screen. So all these advancements kind of lead us up to today and uh, in the prior decade, we see advancements in the entertainment industry, uh, video games like Doom and EverQuest Online. Uh, they show the viability and the desirability for people to cooperate, compete, or just coexist in online persistent environments. And uh, as well, during this decade, there is continued use in the science and military sectors. Um, but definitely around this time, probably to the mid to late 80s to the early 90s, that's when VR kind of sees its first boom bust, right? So it really kicks off in the mid 80s, but by the late 90s, it kind of fizzles out. And that's kind of leads us to the post millennium era. So in the 2000s, video game companies release products that use motion sensing technology that is present in VR headsets today. Um, even though interest in VR has mostly been dormant, in 2012, Palmer Lucky releases the Oculus Rift after gaining public attention. Um, it's available on Kickstarter. It becomes so popular that Facebook acquires Oculus and uh, it's kind of where we are today. I would say we're in this second boom. Recently, Facebook rebranded as Meta to signal their intent to focus on VR and VR adjacent technologies. And whether this second boom continues to gain momentum or whether it just tapers off, that's something that we'll have to wait and see. So in terms of labeling VR experiences, not all VR experiences are equal. So people tend to label or categorize them based on their perceived levels of immersion and interactivity. And I say perceived because um, immersiveness is entirely subjective. It's uh, like the term is somewhat presumptuous just because somebody calls an app or device or system immersive doesn't necessarily mean that you or I will find it immersive. Um, that concept, this construct, is really the result of design factors and user factors. So user factors would include things like the user's experiences and expectations and attributes and situations. And design factors include various things, but the two most prominent ones are the extent of being there, the illusion of being there, also known as telepresence. And the other main design related factor would be the extent of interactivity or agency within that virtual world. So generally speaking, the systems that get the label as being highly immersive are ones that 
involve head-mounted displays that show fairly realistic 3D visuals. And those systems also tend to have motion controls that allow for immediate and obvious actions, especially the kind that resemble actions in real life. But again, as always, just remember, immersiveness is subjective. Um, in terms of context scope, here is a set of terms that you might or might not have heard or seen. VR, of course, is an all digital interaction. There's no perception of the real world as part of the intended experience. That's in contrast to AR or augmented reality. Um, those types of applications are based in the real world and there are non-interactive, usually non-interactive digital elements that exist kind of in between the user and the real world. There's mixed reality or MR um, that involve interaction with both physical and digital elements. Can't really think of any MR experiences, but generally in theory, they would include systems that um, might allow you to use an, a VR system and an AR system at the same time or switch between the two. XR or extended reality is a fairly new term uh, it's an umbrella term that encompasses these three types of technologies. And you kind of think of these three as existing on a continuum. So on the one end of the scale, you've got AR, which is reality-based. And then on the other end of the scale, you've got VR, which is the opposite, virtuality-based, as some people might say. And then in the middle, you've got MR. And of course... Another term that you've probably seen or heard a lot recently is metaverse. Um, in most contexts, it's used as a general synonym for cyberspace, which is essentially a persistent environment that's online and separate from the real world. Um, unlike the internet, for example, there's really no one singular meta metaverse. Um, in reality, in practice, it's more like multiple metaverses that might or might not be connected. So some people might say the metaverse as though there's one metaverse, but that is really not the case. Um, so just kind of to demonstrate, illustrate um, the immersiveness, the subjectivity, su subjectivity of immersiveness and interactivity. Here's a set of four VR and VR adjacent experiences. You can kind of take a look at them and see um, how interactive and how immersive they might be to you. Again, it might be hard to imagine if you've never experienced any or some of these um, experiences, but just kind of look at them briefly. So think of playing a traditional video game on a TV with a controller, um, how immersive and interactive you think it would be to you. Another example would be using a vehicle simulator that uses physical controls, like the one you see here, but does not involve a head-mounted display. How immersive and interactive do you think it would be to you? Another example still would be viewing a movie within a head-mounted display with surround sound. How immersive do you think it might be? And in terms of interactivity, probably low, regardless of the movie. Uh, another example yet would be playing a game within a head-mounted display with motion controls that mimic real-life actions. How immersive do you think you would find that experience? And how interactive it would be, it would seem to you. So again, just to reiterate that point, immersiveness varies from one person to the next. Like the immersiveness of any given experience depends partly on the design of that product, as I mentioned, but also on you, the end user. And before we continue, I'd like you to take a moment, just think, do you know of any VR applications in your field of work or study? And if you don't know of any applications, can you imagine any potential or future applications? So you can pause this presentation and think about it, even discuss 
with your neighbors if you'd like. And I'll wait a moment. Okay, let's move on and here are some actual present day applications. So vocational training, VR has a long history of being used for military training, especially vehicle training like planes, helicopters, tanks. Um, but it's also used in the civilian world like vocational, like, excuse me, skilled trades. Um, even Walmart, for example, uses VR headsets to train their associates. In the field of health and wellness, um, training surgeons also being used as a therapeutic tool for patients and also as a psychological counseling tool for patients as well. In terms of education, there's, uh, you can probably find many examples of VR being used at different levels of education. So at York, for example, last semester an upper year biochemistry course used VR for a set of assignments that involved um, examining molecules in 3D. And also, for example, the Multimedia Language Center has experimented with apps for teaching and learning uh, languages in different environments. And also enterprises that involve physical spaces, so real estate, architecture, interior design, those fields are using VR technology. And that's actually a really good application of that technology. But with any type of device, product, technology as a whole, you don't just want to consume it, you want to interrogate it. Think about the biases that might be inherent to the people, like to the products because of the people who designed it. Think about the consequences, positive, negative, neutral, ones that people are either overlooking or ones that people are downplaying because maybe that's um, detrimental to their cause, company, whatever. Um, think of what people say about the technology and then think about what you say. So even though you might read about how VR technology um, is potentially a very lucrative discipline and how X trillion dollars will be spent by the year, whatever, um, as of right now, VR technology is not commercially viable. You might have heard or read about Meta's financial losses in the past year because of their investment in VR technology. You might hear and read about people saying how products like the Quest and Quest 2 are affordable. Um, they might be affordable to some people, but they won't be affordable to everybody, um, of course. And in terms of accessibility, uh, for people, persons who have disabilities, VR technology in its current state is not particularly accessible or adaptable. Like the designers of VR experiences assume that everybody has two arms and two hands is able to move their hands and figures, and that they have the strength to don a head mounted display and they can move their heads and they can see and hear. Um, it's interesting to note that as VR technology advances and more companies invest in the technology, when they present their products, they tend to present to them more as tools for productivity as opposed to toys for recreation. But the irony is that by moving away from that toy aspect, they're kind of overlooking the advancements that are happening in the gaming industry um, over the past few years. So look at Microsoft and Sony re releasing adaptive controllers that people can use to customized based on their particular needs. You've got video games that release with an impressive set of adaptive and accessibility options and grassroots movements that provide resources, free resources to developers of gaming products to make them accessible. There's nothing like that in the VR world right now. And in terms of privacy and security issues for any type of technology that involves interactivity and interconnectivity, there's always the prospect of hacking, as uh, some researchers at Rutgers have already found out. And in some countries, jurisdictions, there's already government and government oversight and legislative committees that are looking at XR, both the potential 
the positive potential as well as maybe the pitfalls of those products. So just definitely be mindful of the good and bad of any technology.